Hey guys, welcome to Worship Where You Are with Hope City. Um, wherever you're watching from this morning, we're so glad you are here to worship with us. Um, this is designed to be an interactive experience, so be sure to like, comment, and share with your friends. And drop a comment and let us know where you're watching from, from and tell us uh, your favorite thing about the 4th of July. Uh, I think mine would be just eating lots of good food, and you'll see a little bit of that here in, uh, later in the video. Um, some things coming up around Hope City. Next weekend, we're back to in-person gatherings at 10 a.m., and we'd love to have you guys join us at the after-school program. Uh, July 28th is our next Johnson Square Summer Series with an awesome band, Kenan Company. Um, and July 30th, instead of having a normal Sunday worship gathering, uh, we'll be partnering with uh, Shared Beginnings for a local Impact Sunday. And more details on that will be shared uh, later this morning. Um, be sure to check out the comments section below or hopeformwa.city for all the details. We have a great morning lined up, and we're so glad that you guys are here with us. Let's worship together.
Hey, once again, welcome to Worship Where You Are with Hope City. Man, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning as we're continuing week five of our summer series where we've been going through uh, the life of this really famous dude in the Old Testament named David. Uh, David's gone from being shepherd in the pasture to defeating a giant named Goliath to now being king in the palace. Like, this is David's moment. Saul has died and David is now king. And so today what we're going to learn from David is what it means to live an undignified life before God. And when we think about becoming undignified, that might sound kind of weird, and especially like in church, right? Like, uh, that's not how I'm supposed to be in church. I'm supposed to be dignified because all through our lives, we're taught and trained to show dignity, like to dress appropriately and maintain composure. Like, don't get too emotional about things. Speak respectfully, like, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Say please and thank you. And those are all good things, right? But what we're going to see in David's life is that he became undignified. And as he became undignified, God was glorified. So here's the truth. I think we're willing to become undignified for a lot of things in life. Like example number one, calling the hogs. I mean, think like a, a Saturday in the fall in Fayetteville, 50,000 people going, woo, pig, suey, like that is undignified. Or karaoke or dancing at weddings, celebrating birthdays, the birth of our kids, or when you get that raise at work, we become undignified in those moments. I, I remember back a few years ago, I was playing on like a beer league hockey team on like a, a Tuesday night in November. And we were tied at the end of the game. We went into overtime, and somehow I found the puck on my stick in front of the net in overtime, scored the game-winning goal. There was not a fan in the stands, but the guys on my team went crazy. They came off the bench. They're jumping all over me. We're hugging like we just won the Stanley Cup, and we became undignified for something that didn't even matter that much. We become undignified for lots of things in life, and especially in the summer. I mean, we do undignified things that we don't do any other time of the year. I mean, where else is it acceptable for a bunch of adults to run around half naked in public? Not the grocery store, right? No, the, the pool and the lake in the summer, we get undignified. Or how about eating? Have you ever watched a hot dog eating contest? Now that's undignified. And never have I seen a group of grown men and women get more undignified than when we get to blow crap up. And so to set this up, we've come up with our own version of Hope City Jack Butt, all right? Let's get a little undignified this morning. Check this out. Oh yeah, now that goes pop. I'm Gabe and this is Big Bellies. Let's go! Postgame interview with my boy Jake here for the Big Bellies Belly Flop Competition. Jake, what was your inspiration for that? Uh, I just want to first shout out my mom, shout out my dad, shout out my belly flop coach. Um, the inspiration for that was the other day I was walking through my house and I slipped on a banana. And then I flipped around backwards, landed on my stomach. So just daily inspiration. Wow. Got to take the inspiration as it comes. Just absolutely incredible, guys. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and another one. Hey, we're back and we're moving on to our next segment here. I've got Gabe here and we got Andrew moving on to our hot dog eating contest. Gabe, what are you doing to prep for this hot dog devouring time you're about to go through? Hot dogs, they cook they cooked real good um, on, on the stove today. And uh, just been living 23 years right now. Um, I don't know what to do with my hands. It sounds like he doesn't know what's going on. All right, Andrew, what do we got? What did you do to prep for this week? Well, Jared, I didn't eat for three straight days before I came here. Um, feeling drained. Once I get on those hot dogs, it's going down. That's a bold move, Cotton. All right, let's cut to the action. Three, two, one. Let's get it on. Let's go. Andrew, got to eat. Come on. Andrew. Water. Some drink. Yeah. 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 Oh, 
Shake hands, guys. I told you, I'm not confident in many things. <laughs> All right, we're back. We're here with the winner, Gabe. Gabe, how did you pull this off? I mean, you absolutely dominated the competition this year. Just look at me, how I'm built, and look at Andrew. Who do you think eats more food? This guy. Who do you think eats more food faster? This guy. This is what this body was made for. 23 years hard training, paid off today, in an absolute domination. Domination. Joey Chestnut esque domination of the just sad competition. This was, oh. If we do this next year, we gotta get somewhere different. That was a pathetic <laughs> excuse of hot dog eating if I've ever seen it. <laughs> he was talking mad smack all week. Got here, was still talking. Now he's real quiet. Six to two. Six to two. <laughs> Might as well have been a hundred to zero as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> wow. Right. Well, strong words from a strong man. Come Thank on. you. Come on. Hey, this is Jared and this is Blow Crap Up. Let's do it. Here we go. I think it used to be vanilla, but that's what the firework did to it. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Now that was undignified. So here's the question I want to look at this morning. We become undignified in lots of ways, right? But are we willing to become undignified for God? So to, to remind us, David has just taken over as king. He set up the capital in Jerusalem, which continues to be the modern day capital, capital of Israel today. And he realizes that his being king isn't worth anything without God's presence with him. And so David asked this question, he goes, how can I show the people that it's not me who they should trust, but it's God who is the true king? It's not military might or strength that saves us, but it's a deep, intimate relationship with God. See, David wanted to like know God, not just know about him, not just sing, sing some songs to him. Like David wanted to know God deeply, and his desire was to show the people of Israel that God had entrusted to David to protect and provide for, how to know that same God as well. And so we're gonna be in 2 Samuel chapter six today. So 2 Samuel chapter six, verse one, David brought to, together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. The ark represented God's presence with his people. They set the ark of God on a new cart and they brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, two sons of Abinadab, were guiding the, the, the new cart with the ark of God on it and Ahio was walking beside it. David and all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets and harps and lyres and trumpets and cisterns and cymbals. And it's like this massive worship gathering before God. Like maybe you've seen Indiana Jones and, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That's the ark of the covenant that we're talking about here. And again, what the Ark of the Covenant represented was God's presence with his people. When Moses came out of Egypt with the Israelites, God wanted to give his people a visible representation of the throne room of heaven and the very throne that God sits on as king. And that's what the Ark was meant to represent. And on this Ark, there's a seat called the mercy seat, where every year the high, the high priest would apply blood of an animal to the mercy seat, where it would be representative of another dying in the place of the sins of the people, because all throughout the Old Testament, we learn that sin leads to death. And it was by this sacrifice that people could enter into the presence of a holy God. Well, as David and the Israelites are bringing the Ark toward Jerusalem, they're worshiping God. Like imagine the biggest worship gathering you've ever been part of, then take it like times 10. And in the middle of that, things start to get weird because the oxen pulling the cart that the ark is on they stumble and the ark starts to tip over and this dude named Uzzah who is with the ark he actually reaches out to catch the ark to keep it from falling into the dirt and when he touches it like he just drops dead like he dies and that's weird right it's like that scene on the Raiders of the Lost Ark when uh, the Germans look at the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of God like melts their faces off and they all die 
And now we don't have time to fully get into this part of the story this morning, all the meaning behind it, but God had commanded his people to never touch the ark. And he said if they did, they would die. See, in this moment, Uzzah's intentions were good. He didn't want the ark to hit the ground, to hit the dirt. But he fully underestimates the, 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 the uncleanliness of his own life and the depth of his own sin. And God's showing the Israelites in this moment the, the depth of their own sin and the holiness of his presence. See, for Uzzah and for us, good intentions and religious efforts and just living a good life aren't enough to take away our sin. There has to be a sacrifice. There has to be one who takes our sin who dies for it and makes a way to enter into God's presence. And that's the good news of the gospel. Tim Keller defines it this way. When he talks about the good news of the gospel, he says that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. And so in response to this moment, David's afraid and he sends the ark to the house of a dude named Obed-Edom. And if you think about it, if you're this dude who has the ark in your house and a guy's just touched it and died, it's like, thanks a lot for that gift, David. But something interesting happens in his house as he holds the presence of God in its proper place. He holds it as holy. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 12, it says that King David received word back from Obed-Edom's house. And it it says that the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of the Lord in his house. And so David went to bring the ark of of God up from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David, that's Jerusalem, and they did it with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, they stopped and they sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. See, when we hold the holiness of God in its proper place, We get to enjoy the presence of God. And the reality is this, God wants us to enjoy his presence. And this time after just six steps, those carrying the ark stopped to make a sacrifice. Why is that? Well, anytime a sacrifice was made in the Old Testament, the priest would first touch the animal being sacrificed, signifying the sins of the people being placed on that animal. And then it would be sacrificed in the place of humans who had sinned because God made it clear that sin leads to death. And even though God wants us to be in his presence, the only way for sinful humans to come into the presence of a holy God is through the sacrifice of another. It doesn't happen by good works or good intentions. And that's what happens here as David and the Israelites receive forgiveness for their sins. They get to enter into God's presence and it leads to this moment of pure, uninhibited joy. And that's when David gets undignified. Verse 14, it says, Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all of his might. Well, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. That, that, linen, that linen ephod that David was wearing, it's traditional Jewish underwear, all right? Like David is worshiping so hard and with so much passion, he rips off his clothes and he starts worshiping with all his might and he gets caught up in the, the joy and passion of the moment and strips down to his underwear. I mean, can you imagine? That's undignified. Um, I, I told Andrew that, that he'd be fired if he ever showed up to lead worship in his tidy whities or gets crazy like that. But man, can you imagine this? David gets so caught up in the joy of the moment in God's presence that he's dancing with all of his might before the Lord and he strips down to his underwear. It's what my kids do when they get so fired up and they just throw their clothes off and they go running around the house in their underwear or let's be honest, sometimes naked, all right? So why is it though that David is experiencing so much joy? Well, he knows the depth of his own sin and the absolute holiness of God. And despite the disconnect between the two, David knows that God loves him and accepts him anyway. I mean, think about that. David had and would mess up some big stuff in his life along the way. Yet he was in total awe that God would choose him and show him grace and make him king. And there was nothing dignified about David, yet David or God wanted David anyway. And so David became undignified before God. What about us? Can we see the sheer gift of grace that God has given us? That he's chosen us and called us his own. And all of the mess of our sin and our indignity, Ephesians says that he's given us a place in his family. He seated us as sons and daughters, kings and queens in his presence. It's completely a gift of grace. Giving us what we need, not what we deserve. And before a gift like that, and a God that good, let me ask you, can you become undignified? Well, as it turns out, there were some who were there that day with David who couldn't get there. They couldn't get their heads around it. And one of those people was David's wife, the queen of Israel, Michal. Verse 16 says that as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, the daughter of Saul, who's David's wife, she watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. 
And when David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and she said, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would, like she doesn't get it. Michal goes, David, don't you know you're supposed to be the king? And the king is supposed to be dignified. Like, I can't believe you were out there celebrating before everyone like that. See, in every other religion, the thing that keeps us from God's presence is our failure. But in Christianity, the only thing that keeps us from God's presence is failing to admit our failure. And that's what's playing out here with Macau. She's too caught up in her own status as queen to understand the extent of her own sin and the depth of God's grace and the joy and the undignity that comes from being loved by him anyway. And so in verse 21, David replies to her and he goes, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the people of Israel. This is kind of like David giving her the spiritual middle finger here. And he goes, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. Here's the reality. We'll become undignified for a lot of things, right? Dancing at weddings, karaoke, eating hot dogs, blowing th stuff up, calling the hogs, playing with our kids, hanging out with friends around the table with good food and good drinks. We get undignified in those moments. But the question is this, are you willing to humble yourself? And are you willing to become undignified before God? Remember, in every story that we're looking at this summer in the life of David, it's not so much what do I learn from David that I apply to my life. It's what do I learn about Jesus through David that I apply to my life. And the reality of this story is that it points to the fact that God loved us so much that he gave his son for us as a sacrifice for our sins so that we could enter into his presence and we could enjoy him and we could celebrate and we could worship him. But in order for that to happen, Jesus had to become undignified. And he challenges us to do the same. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says that in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself. He became undignified by taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus said that he came not to be served, but to serve and being made in human likeness. He became like us in every way. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by become, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. See, Jesus became undignified for us. And by Jesus becoming undignified for us and taking our sins on himself through the cross, we are now free to enter the presence of God. And we're told that when we do, we receive the grace and mercy we need in the moments we need it the most. And I don't know about you, but when I really pause and reflect on that, when I really take that truth in, man, it leads to pure joy and maybe even getting a little undignified. So here's the question. Jesus was willing to get undignified for us. So will we get undignified for him? And what's that look like? Well, Philippians 2 tells us that Jesus, when he came into the world, he took on the form of a servant. And on the last night of his life, Jesus told his disciples that the way the world would know that they follow him is by the way that we empty ourselves and we love and we serve others. Tim Keller again defined humility or undignity this way. It's not becoming selfless, but it's learning to think of yourself less. It's having eyes focused on Jesus which leads us to having eyes focused on the people in our lives that Jesus loves and cares about. So what does this look like? Well, on an individual level, it's learning to love and serve others the way that Jesus has loved and served you and gave his life up for you. But as a church, we have an incredible opportunity coming up at the end of, our, of this month with our partner shared beginnings. Let's check out this video in Hope City. It's time to get a little undignified this summer. So my name is Michelle Omonti. I am the founder and executive director of Shared Beginnings. We're a nonprofit birth family support center here just down the road in Johnson, and we're a licensed nonprofit adoption agency. Um, our mission behind Shared Beginnings is really to empower the community to build healthier families by supporting pregnant women, first families, adoptees, and adoptive families. And we really focus on the support of moms who are pregnant and who are working to, to decide what parenting path is best for their children. Um, oftentimes we work with moms who are in crisis, um, moms who are overwhelmed, moms who are food and housing unstable potentially, 
And so our goal is to become lifelong partners with them and walk alongside them no matter their parenting choice and really just be there to support them with mental health services and really help to make sure that they are able to successfully parent other children that they may already have or may have in the future. Um, and so again, it's just really to break that cycle of crisis and poverty um, that so many of these women unfortunately become stuck in. So we are super excited to partner with Hope City in Shared Connections that's coming up on July 30th. This is the first time that we've been able to open this event to the public. So anyone kind of what we call within the adoption triad, so adoptees, birth parents, adoptive parents, um, everyone we wanna come in and connect. The original intention is for adoptive parents to bring their kiddos back and so that they can mingle and make memories with their birth families. But also, if you don't have birth families in the area or if your birth family isn't in the area, your child's birth family, we want this to be a time where adoptees can connect to adoptees, where adoptive parents can connect to adoptive parents, birth families to birth families, um, and just know that this is a safe space where you're understood. So this partnership with Hope City is so important and we're so excited about it because last year we had 75 attendees and this year we're hoping to have over 250 attendees. The venue with the after school program is fantastic and just will enable so many connections to happen. And we've got a lot of fun things and a lot of volunteer opportunities where people can get plugged in. I think a lot of times we talk about openness and relationship and adoption after the child is born and moved to the adoptive family. But from our perspective, adoption really is a ripple effect ministry and it's a long, it's a lifelong commitment um, to raising that child, to being a part of another family. And so these events are just opportunities to bring those connections together, to strengthen those connections, to help those kiddos um, really build and understand their stories and their identity. Um, and we're just so excited we're able to open that up to the community this year and have Hope City be a huge part of it. Yeah, we're excited. Sweet, that's it, that's it. Yeah. So Hope City, how about you? You ready to get a little undignified so God can be glorified? Let's go get after it. Are we ready to take our eyes off of ourselves and place them on Jesus who loved us enough to give up his life for us so we can literally be adopted? Think about that word, adopted into the family of God. So for one weekend, it's not about us. On July 30th, it's not about a feeling or singing songs or making us feel good about ourselves before God. It's about taking our eyes off ourselves and serving families in our community and letting them experience Jesus through us. When we become undignified in how we serve and love others, here's the reality, God gets glorified. So check out hopefornwa.city. You can check out all the details for shared connections there. You can sign up to serve, invite a friend to come with you. It's time to get a little undignified so God can be glorified. We're gonna move into our time of prayer that we do every week. And this is a time where we pause to remember all that God has done in our direction. And so wherever you are, whether you're on the road or at the lake or in your living room, would you just take a minute to pause? And would you reflect on this? Think about how valuable you are to God. And how valuable is God to you? And what joy does it bring you to think about that Jesus gave himself up for you despite all the, the flaws and the faults and the failures and the unholiness of our lives, Jesus made a way for us to enter into the presence of a perfectly holy God so that that God could be glorified. And we take communion every time during, during this time of prayer. So wherever you are, grab a cracker or a goldfish or whatever you have around and, and, and bring something that represents like a cup of juice. And Jesus on the last night of his life, he took this piece of bread and cup of juice and it signified him emptying himself, him becoming undignified. His body was broken, his blood was poured out for the forgiveness of our sins so that we could have direct access to our Father. So take the next few minutes, connect with Jesus around this, and then we're gonna continue to worship together. And maybe, just maybe, as this message sinks into your heart and your head, maybe you get a little undignified singing no matter where you are today.
take it with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we hear Christ be magnified where the
City, thanks for being with here with us this morning. Don't forget to check out hope for nwa.city to check out all the things coming up around here. Um, and if you guys need prayer for anything, feel free to message us here or drop a comment below. We have a team that would love to be praying for you. Um, we'd love to see you in person next weekend at 10 a.m. Uh, at the after school program. Um, but with that said, have a great week and we'll see you next time.